Hey, and oh, we're cool. live. Hey. Hey. So welcome everybody to another um another stream where we're talking about about Star Trek Lower Decks. Oh, I'm just gonna do one thing here. Sorry, everybody. Oops. Mm -hmm. What am I? I'm messing everything up. Anyway, here. Hi, everybody. We're here to talk about Star Trek Lower Decks. Um, welcome to the stream. I'm Nicole. I'm going to fix one thing with my audio. How about you introduce yourself, starting with RC today? Hi, I'm RC. You can find me on Twitter at the Neon Green City. Um, I don't have a lot to plug uh, other than my Twitter. Um, yeah, just lifelong Star Trek fan. Grew up on Star Trek. Always happy to talk about it. Ah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, How about you, Gary? Hi, I'm uh, Gary uh, uh, Spearwalker on Twitter, though I'm not very active there, so don't expect me to get back to you right away if you do message me. Um, um, I've been a Trekkie pretty much because my father pumped a lot of sci-fi into my head as a kid. Um, he enjoyed it, so I ended up watching it with him and uh, picked up the, the love affair with it as a result and have uh, kind of followed Star Trek since I was super like, stoked when Generations came out. Like, that was, like, huge. Yeah, and I'm Nicole, as I said, uh, having a few issues with my... <laughs> with my camera, uh, and I have been watching Star Trek for quite a long time um, as well. My dad was super into Star Trek and used to watch the original series a lot and try and encourage me to do so as well. Um, I was not super into it at the time, but uh, his kind of enthusiasm must have rubbed off on me because I was very, very hyped when uh, Next Generation came out. And I've been watching it pretty much ever since. So uh, what we like to do here is uh, Gary and I have been getting together to do some post-survivor streams. And uh, after that, we've um, we've done some of those. Romy, Darcy, and uh, Gary and I have been talking about Lower Decks. And we're going to start talking about Discovery, probably. And uh, we were also wondering, uh, Gary and I were saying, oh, are we going to have to do a uh, Strange New World stream as well? Or, or maybe collapse uh, Disco and Strange New Worlds into one stream. I'm not sure uh, well, what's going to come up. Are, are, is Strange New World and Disco airing simultaneously? I don't believe they are. It's, it, I believe in the panel, because uh, that's something else we really have to probably discuss yeah. today. Is, is the, the, only panel. Panel I watched, the only panel I watched was the one for Lower Decks. I haven't seen any other ones, so anything revealed in that, I know nothing. Well, um, not to, this won't be spoiler-wise, but in the panel, they definitely said that it's going to air on CTV as well. CTV SciTi, which is great for us in Canada. That means that we get to see um, Lower Decks as well as um, Stranger Worlds and Picard and pretty much all of the Star Trek on CTV without having to subscribe to uh, CBS All Access or Crave or something like that, which is pretty awesome. Uh, we discussed this in a previous stream. Uh, we're wondering if it has something to do with um, the long kind of running relationship that CTV and City TV in Canada have had with uh, the Star Trek franchise. Star Trek is also huge in Canada, like just massive here. Yeah, uh, we've had a lot of Star Trek cons here um, for a very, very long time. The um, biggest con in in kind of the area, uh, Toronto Trek recently rebranded. And uh, maybe that was a bad idea. <laughs> maybe Toronto Trek shouldn't have rebranded so quickly. Um, Anyway, uh, the panel, maybe let's talk about that real real quickly first because it was an interesting opportunity to see some of the people behind the voices and uh, for some discussion about where Lower Decks is going and what was going on. Uh, we didn't get to see many of the writers, but we did get to see the creator uh, who we've discussed a little bit in the past, um, someone who used to work on Rick and Morty and has worked on a number of other uh, animated shows in the past, and uh, the cast, who who some of them look, 
I was actually surprised how much uh, Noelle Wells, who uh, plays Tendi, actually looks like her character. Uh, yeah, they have they, a lot of similarities. They clearly went off the the performers as a basis for um, what the actors should look like. To some extent, I, I actually, it, it was funny because um, I did not connect uh, Jack Quaid with uh, Huey and the boys at all. Um, I did not connect those two people, but now that I hear his voice as Boimler, I can't yeah, yeah. disconnect the two of them after going back to the boys, which is kind of funny, um, which is another show. Uh, I could talk about that and my conflicted I, feelings about it right now, but um, I have not seen the boys. Um, we shouldn't get off track. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a Garth Ennis thing. I'm not a big Garth Ennis fan, so I haven't bothered watching it. It's um, it's got its issues. It's got also interesting commentary, but I'm not sure if the commentary outweighs the issues at this point. To mm -hmm. be honest, that's um, my concern. I don't know how Gary feels about it. We watched the most recent episode uh, last night, and uh, I felt a little gross. The last yeah. two episodes, I don't know how Gary feels. Gary is not great with violence, so... Yeah, no, it's been pretty extreme. <laughs> um, so, uh, we, we probably shouldn't get too off course. But yeah, yeah, we won't get too off topic if, with that. If, if In any case, to... the panel was the panel was good to see, like, um, I enjoyed seeing how much um, really affection and enthusiasm everyone had for being on the yeah. show. Yeah. I also, um, also love, appreciate that they treat Jack White exactly the way they treat Boiler. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Like, I mean, it's no matter true. what show he's really on, he really seems to get, like, the he's shit end guy. of the stick. Well, he's that guy. He's that guy. He's the Gary, Gary. Oh, no. Uh, Gary is always frustrated with the fact that uh, uh, it's always Gary. That It's always the Gary that gets... Um, the, the guy who's uh, getting... Getting uh, screwed is always Gary, or the guy who's always the loser is always Gary, named Gary. Like yeah. in Rat Queens, the first Rat Queens. Fictions in media are not very fair to the name Gary. Yeah, he feels that Gary shouldn't be so maligned, that there are honorable Garys. <laughs> <laughs> but Boimler is the Gary, unfortunately. Jack Quaid is the Gary Yes. in life. Um, so that was good to see. I really enjoyed seeing that and I enjoyed hearing about some of the things and they, they actually previewed this week's episode uh, talking about Jack McBrayer, who's going to be in the show who played uh, Badgie. I don't know if RC, you watched a, a lot of um, uh, 30 Rock at all. No, no. Uh, my sister's a big 30 Rock fan. I never got around to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, he, Jack McBrayer's Kenneth is a pretty recognizable character. He was the page in it, uh, the the sweet uh, kind of country, country bumpkin usher at NBC who said uh, deeply disturbing things from time to time. So who was kind of perfect for this uh, Clippy-esque um, uh, personal assistant that uh, Rutherford creates yeah. and uh, goes horribly, horribly wrong. I, um, I, I, I like the veggie. I like veggie a lot. <laughs> I love veggie. Um, it's probably one of the best things they've done in the yeah. show so far. Um, um, I think veggie is now the new kind of um, lower deck Moriarty. Yeah, yeah. that I, I stole that to tweet that. And I'm sorry, Gary, because a I'm lot sorry. of people liked it. But <laughs> it, <laughs> Gary it, said it, that and I tweeted it immediately. They even foreshadowed it um, because they even talk before they go to the before they go into the, the hollow deck. They're like, uh, oh, the whole deck isn't just for like hanging out with yeah, Sherlock yeah, Holmes yeah. and yeah, Socrates, and you know. Actually, they foreshadowed it. I think in, I'm not sure if it's episode three or four, but Boimler says something about Moriarty, and then says, "Never talk about Moriarty. Don't mention yeah. Moriarty." Yeah. And so I, yeah. I feel like I feel like we're going to see more of Jack McFerrin, which is pretty awesome. They yeah. also. The ending certainly implies we will. Yes, it, it really did. Um, and in the panel, they also discussed a few other, a bunch of other guest stars that they have, including that, that as we were talking about before the stream, John Delancey as Q will be showing up, which is wonderful. Um, I don't think it's going to be as long as we hope it will be. Yeah. <laughs> I, think it'll, I think it'll be a before credit stinger. And that'll yeah. be it. 
Yeah. And I mean, yeah, yeah, like a cold open or something. And I mean, um, as much as we want more of that, that's probably the best way to go with it, to be honest. I think um, that that we probably want more Q um, and and getting more Q is probably like not the best idea, like giving us more than than we're asking for. Yeah. Or giving oh. giving the fans what they want in terms of that character is probably not the best idea. I I think that like of all of the characters from TNG, uh, I think Q is the one that meshes the best with the show. Like it'd be weird, it'd be weird yeah, to have yeah. a, bunch of, a bunch of like uh, Voyager, DS Nine, or TNG characters into the show. Mm. Q fits fine. Like you can throw, but like Picard for like if they brought Picard back for like one episode. It would be really weird. There's Q oh, behind you right now. Yeah. Yes, there is. I have Yeah, back yeah, back. he's on TV. Speaking of Q, he appears as if by magic or omniscience. But like if if they put any other character other than Q, like if they, they like Worf, Worf would just take over the episode. It'd just be a Worf episode. Yeah. Like, so Q's the only character it's from true. TV they can really throw in at all. And not have it like dominate the show. Yeah, I think I think or I think Q is a good idea, and I think I think being judicious with it is is a good idea. And, but I think using those tropes of of the um, series, like the holodeck character that takes over everything and becomes an nemesis, yeah. that's a good idea. It's better than having actual Moriarty, unless Moriarty yeah. showed up and they like yeah. deleted him or something like that. Yeah. Um, although now, now I'm picturing like if they did a time travel episode and combine and put the lower decks people into Enterprise and had the Enterprise cast back, that would be prime. That would be great. Like, I, I just I love, I, I mean, I watched the captains recently and seen it, but Gary had and that and the Enterprise panel. Um, I was just impressed at like what a great guy Scott Bakula seems to be. I mean, aside from, you know, being on Quantum Leap, I'm just like, he seems like the greatest guy in the world. He seems like just a good guy to be around. And like, he's just a calming presence and is nice I, to hang I'm out actually, with. I'm actually a big apologist for Enterprise. Um, I don't think it's like of all the Star Trek shows, it's definitely the worst. But <laughs> in, the end, yes. in the end, it's still just more Star Trek. Like, and I definitely think it deserves its place along the Star Trek in the Star Trek, like, canon. Like, I think um, the least of Star Trek is still Star Trek, and I still think that Enterprise is worth watching. It, it's like it's like pizza is bad pizza is still pizza. Exactly. Exactly. It's still, it's still pizza. It's still pretty good, you know. Except for we've had pizza some places that was not. The, the only Star Trek... That I think is objectively bad Star Trek is a couple of the TNG movies. Not even all of them, just a couple of them. Some of them are cheesier than others. Some of them are just kind of weird, I find. I find them entertaining, but they're just kind of strange. Yeah. Like 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 Deanna and, and Beverly talking about their boobs getting bouncier. Things like that in that one movie that was weird. I don't remember that. That's oh, a- it was oh, when yeah. they were on the planet where everybody was getting younger. They were like, are your boobs lifting or something? I'm like, oh no, what's happening? Anyway, one, one of those things you can definitely tell that the script was written by a man. And yeah, they, it was. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was. It was strange. It they was some strange girl real. talk. Um, speaking of girl talk, <laughs> let's get to episode five. Which was, um, I think it's called Cupid's Errant Arrow, I believe. Yeah, I think that's right. Which is the episode uh, where Boimler has a girlfriend, where we realize that um, uh, the ship itself was a Canadian girlfriend joke, uh, which was very nice. Good job, writers. I appreciate that. They had a, a Barbara is on a Parliament class starship uh, <laughs> called the Vancouver. And no one believes, or at least Mariner does not believe she's real. So, um, Boimler has a fake Canadian girlfriend. Um, it was it was a good episode. It it again it addresses like so early on. I had an issue with like um, Mariner being sort of too perfect, and it once again sort of addresses like okay, she's really knowledgeable, 
but that knowledge that that her knowledgeableness trips her up. Yeah, um, and I I like I like it. If it, if it it really whatever lingering problems I had with her characterization of Mariner from the first couple episodes were were pretty much dealt with here. Yeah, the the I read um a headline for a review or part of a review. I'm not sure which of them. Sorry, I can't credit whoever said this, but it said something like. Um, uh, this episode was uh, shows what happens when you watch too much Star Trek, and and it was basically like yeah, it it she was convinced everything had gone it, w it was wrong because this per woman was too perfect to want to date this guy, yeah, and you know obviously something was wrong with her, and uh, Barbara became the convinced of the same thing, which was kind of hilarious. Uh, um, also, I was just. As as a moment of like as a momentary diversion, the DS9 uh, flashback, like the DS9 era uniforms in that one flashback. Oh yeah, yeah, looks so good. Like that they that, did the brown color palette with those uniforms really fit the aesthetic really well. I actually kind of I was like, man, I, I kind of wish they went with the DS9 aesthetic. As opposed to a TG aesthetic. I actually really liked Mariner's hair there too. Oh, her hair. <laughs> yeah. was her fabulous. giant like yeah, afro. Yeah. It was fabulous. I really loved it. I'm like, that looks great. It was a great look for like y y placing her in a younger time period, right? Yeah, I I just like that whole moment. I thought that whole moment was really good. And I just I just I'm like I'm like, man, why can't this show look like this? I, I, because I guess they're placing it in that TNG time period or post TNG well, time period. And, and DS9 looked that way because it wasn't a Federation ship. That's a big part of it. Well, and it's a, it's a, uh, specifically a star base, right? Yeah. Well, it's all, so, it was built by the Cardassians. And so, so maybe that's, that's something to do with the uniforms too, I suppose. I don't know. Maybe they just wanted. To get them out of those terrible uniforms, which apparently caused people back problems and did horrible things to them and ruined uh, Patrick Stewart's back for like years because of the way they pull if they're cut the wrong way or something. Yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, I enjoyed that part. Um, and I did enjoy that... Um, that it was some sort of like parasite or something that was attracting them to one another because she did seem kind of too cool to be into Boimler. Um, and that I, I really, but I really did feel, and maybe it's just me being, you know, bi again. Um, but I thought there was a lot of chemistry between Mariner and Barbara. And then I was like, I wanted them to be, she, when she was like, you're just a very attractive, normal human woman. And then I'm like, Oh, yeah, Are they going to no. get together? But I mean, they left that open maybe a little bit. I don't see them really following up on it, but they're gonna um, they're no. gonna hang out. So I, I definitely think that they're just going to do the the disaster by thing with Mariner, and they're probably never going to acknowledge it beyond like a punchline to a joke. Um, I also love that parasite. That is the cutest fucking parasite ever. I know it's so cute. <laughs> it was so cute, and and it it made a lot of sense as to why like. She would be dating him. I mean, I understand uh, Gary talked a little bit about what he thought about um, Mariner and Boiler's relationship. Uh, you were talking about how she oh, views yeah. him like as a little brother sort of thing. Yeah, no, she seemed like this episode, it seemed like she was taking him on as like a sibling. And that seems to be kind of like looking back now where she's kind of positioned herself. Like she's the bigger sister who's going to take care of this idiot because he doesn't know what he's doing and he's going to get himself killed if, if she's not around, right? Because yeah. some alien is going to suck his face off. Yeah. Episode, like, rewatching when I when I rewatch episode one and two, I definitely got those vibes from it on my second viewing of them. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, and I, I like how much further that relationship seems to go like she was so determined at one point to get to him to stop this person from killing him or yeah. or you know impregnating him with like lizard eggs or whatever she thought was going to happen um yeah. it was it was pretty intense uh but as as you said rc it's like 
she's so wound up into all of the all of the things she's seen or all of the things she believes that she can't ever just let it be something simple yeah i'm actually as as much as i love that as much as i genuinely love that parasite because it was so funny um i i i'm a little disappointed that there was a parasite i think it would have been like even if she got the wrong person even with boimler who had the parasite not uh not what's her name um, I think it would have been even better if there was no parasite at all, because then it really would have highlighted just how, like, um, just sort of how into the lore Mariner is and how that does distort her worldview. Yeah, no, I get that too. I mean, even if, even if she, even if at the end Barbara and even if they had found a reason to break out Barbara and Boimler, I mean, that would have yeah. been fine. And and I think having it confirmed that it was some sort of parasite, she's like, well, I was right after all to some yeah. extent, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, although once and again, that, that parasite was really funny, and it was almost worth it just for the joke. But yeah, yeah, I, think, I, I mean, think, it, 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 and it wasn't it wasn't bad in terms of of relationships because I mean, it's somewhat relatable to have. Um, like I mean, I think we can all relate to someone dating someone that you're you're you have like a sense about, and that you're you're not yeah. sure about, and you're you're wanting them to not be dating that person. Um, but uh, I mean, at the same time, it was it was a little I don't know. I think I think that part is relatable. It was just a little. It was a little annoying that she was confirmed to be right again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then we have Tendy and Rutherford. Um, who have a B plot again? <laughs> um, I like their B plot in this episode. They're, they're it wasn't. It wasn't too bad. They found out that you know they think that their ship is not so great, and they found out that every ship is like has its issues, <laughs> and they should probably be grateful to be where they are. Yeah, I um the. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's like, you think it's great? You think it's great being on like these high profile ship? It's crazy! I want out. <laughs> it's epic. It's too epic. Well, do you catch they do a Dyson sphere? Uh, yeah, the Dyson uh, sphere yeah. reference. Yeah, there were a lot of good references. Actually, I really enjoyed the reference that um, that Mariner made to to the people in jumpsuit, the sexy people in jumpsuits oh, who yeah, kill yeah, you yeah. if you walk on the grass. <laughs> That was uh, when Wesley walked on the grass and they were going to execute him at the sexy pl- pleasure planet in one of the first first season episodes. Man. There are some good ones in there. Um, yeah, they. I, I kind of enjoy their relationship in this one, uh, Tendi and Rutherford, because it, it's something you were saying, I think, RC, like just in messages or something, that they seem better as sort of like uh, platonic friends in a lot of ways because yeah, I really uh, enjoyed their sort of rivalry in that episode. I, and sorry, go on. I really like I really like them together. I just they they have about as much chemistry as a paper bag. I think they have chemistry as friends. Like I think yeah. they're really entertaining as friends, and they're kind of like technical <laughs> rivalry. And wanting yeah. to one up each other, and uh, they find really great solutions together. It's just yeah. for some reason I don't buy this romantic relationship. Romantic I don't know why. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, they, they don't have romantic chemistry. Like as like even setting aside the fact that he seems like he should be really ki- really uh, ace coded, and she seems like she's really queer coded. Even setting that aside. Uh, like even saying saying said like like how how we reread their sexuality they just don't have romantic chemistry together as character. Boimler and Mariner have more romantic chemistry together than Tendi and uh, Rutherford. Mm. Um, yeah, it's strange and- because even if I set aside, yeah, totally. Even if I set aside what I might read their characters as, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to you know assume they're attracted to each other let's see how this goes. It's just sort of like, really? Yeah. Really? Like, you know, it's like, I've, I've gone like, I've been kind of like that since day one. Cause I caught, I caught the, the, the setup right on the first episode and I've been kind of in that, like, I don't really, I'm not vibing this. 
um, right from the start. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I it, especially it's problematic because they work so well as friends. Uh huh. Right. I mean, and maybe maybe that's maybe that's where they'll ultimately go. Maybe they'll they'll do the like, oh, will they? Won't they? And then they'll go on a date, and the date doesn't work, and they'll go back to being friends. Like mm-hmm. that is that is definitely a direction this show could go. Um, but I really hope that they don't like force a romantic relationship between those two. I, I think they work extremely well as friends, and I kind of don't want that relationship disrupted. Yeah, it seems. It seems really, I don't know. It seems sort of strange. I'm not really sure yeah. why it's happening, but I guess it's sort of a plot that they intended to have and, and yeah. they're going along with it. It just, um, it doesn't work super well for me, even though I like both of the characters and, and I would be like, you know, if, if they were together and they were happy, I'd be like, sure, I'm happy for them. But I'm just sort of like, it doesn't, it doesn't really ring right for them. Yeah, it just it yeah it, just, it seems like it just doesn't seem the way the char- those characters want to go. It seems like they're being railroaded in this plot line that just does not suit them. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have the issue that Tendi hasn't had a solo story arc yet. True. Rutherford, Rutherford's had two, and all of Tendi's B plots have been shared with Rutherford, except for her plot with the guy that she. Right, he did. Yeah. Then yeah. fell in love with, the with and became plot. friends with him. Yeah, the with ascension it. plot, uh, which we discussed at length last episode. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that really. I don't know even know if that's really a solo plot. Yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah, because really, it was it was that guy's plot line, and Tendi was just the inciting incident for it, and yeah. Like I said, Teddy just hasn't had her own story arc. She just really hasn't. Like everyone she's had, she's shared it with someone else. To a certain extent, yeah. yeah. I mean, she really. I think she kind of needs to have her own thing. And and I'd like to see more of what kind of what she does in medical because yeah. she's just sort of there in medical, and I'm not really sure what she does or why she's there or what she's good at. Yeah, I, I I'm assuming she's a nurse of some sort, but. Beyond that, it's there. There's been no attention paid by the show to the medical, um, to the medical wing at all. Like the doctor barely even gets, uh, of all the bridge, like of all the of all the the sort of the higher up, higher ranking, the doctor is also the one who gets the least attention. Yeah, despite being a literal crazy. cat lady. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I mean, the uh, only other thing I think I probably mentioned about uh, that episode is uh, something Gary pointed out when we were watching it the second time is it didn't have any um, open like cold open opening stinger kind of thing which was interesting because almost all of them had so far so I'm not sure if they didn't have one for it or they had one that didn't work out or my my assumption is the main plot ran long and so they cut it for time Hmm. I'm, I'm probably something like that. So they probably had something and they just didn't have time for it. So yeah. fair enough. So the uh, episode six, um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Uh, I will look yeah, it up later. Um, although I am on the Lower Decks w- uh, Wikipedia right now. Okay. So give me one second and I will have it. So... Episode six. Uh, ter- terminal provocations. Okay, so in that one we had um, Shaq really wanting to blow people up, which was highly uh, entertaining. Yeah. And we had the first um, member of the Lower Decks crew that was not, even though despite issues or whatever, was not actually good at their job. Yeah, I knew that guy was going to turn up to be a douchebag. I knew the second he showed up, because it's like it's like wow, this this intro stinger is certainly putting a lot of emphasis on this one random character we've never met before. And then the then the credits play. It's like oh, this random character we've never met before is still here. Well, he's clearly going to be a douchebag because they would have introduced him earlier if he wasn't. Yeah, and he seemed like a particular like particularly brotastic sort of guy. Yeah. 
Um, yes. Though there there was some of the cat lady, but mostly um, Dr. Cat Lady, Tan, Tana, or et cetera, was being grouchy, which is the other thing that they have her around for, is to be angry at people. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a good gag. I, I'm, I'm good with that. Like, I'm good with, like, just grouchy cat lady. lady. Like, Cats but, are grouchy. Like, That's their thing. Yeah. They get old. Um, they get angry. It's a, it's a play on McCoy, because McCoy was also always grumpy. True. I I just really think she's uh she reminds me of Pulaski. She's Cat Pulaski. You're right. She'll always be Cat Pulaski to me. She's like Pulaski, but a cat. But yeah, so either way, I don't uh I just keep laughing about that because it, she she she's is exactly if Pulaski was a cat, like if you made Pulaski into a cat, that is exactly what I would imagine her looking like. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. She she looks like Pulaski and has the personality of McCoy. Pulaski had the personality of McCoy, essentially. <laughs> Fair enough. Pulaski is just a mean old... <laughs> I mean, she's a great character, but she was an a mean, angry old lady. Yeah. Didn't fair. like anybody and wasn't happy about being there, which I respect. I have no problem with that. Yeah, I know that that, that would be me. That would very. <laughs> that me. I don't like, want to be that, here either. That's me. Shut at up. Work. That's don't me talk at to work. me. <laughs> I uh, I really liked uh, when she said Starbase eighty. I <laughs> love the guy who's in the book. dude Starbase eighty. <laughs> was, that a, was that an inside reference that I didn't catch? No, I think it was just. I don't know. Maybe we should look it up. But I thought it was really funny because I just. You know, like whoa, low blow. <laughs> yeah, you don't say that. I, I thought it was really funny too, but also I thought it might be a reference to something I didn't remember. I will look it up and see. But I, I, just the guy yelling out, "Dude, Star, uh, man, Starbase 80. Like, don't say that. <laughs> I just really like that. Like and she was like, "You mentioned Mariner. You mentioned Starbase eighty. You better be ready to throw down, man." Yeah, I. I uh, uh, yeah, that's it's uh, Federation Starbase, less than desirable. Mid twenty fourth century, somewhere in the Alpha and Beta quadrants. So it's a reference to like. Uh, but it's, so it's not a direct reference to anything featured in any of the movies or, or show that I've like just forgotten about, eh? It's it's in a couple of novels. Oh, yeah. See, novels are the one thing I haven't read. I've never read any of the novels. No, I haven't read novels either. But apparently, um, apparently it was in a novel, Guinan and Jordi LaForge. Oh, okay. Uh, reference and... Uh, there is a Captain Ransom, which is interesting. Uh, Probably related to Ransom. This, this show has so many deep cuts that that's yeah. no coincidence. Yeah, no kidding. And uh, yeah, there was a, a reference to it in a Voyager novelization as well. Oh, okay. So, All right. so it's, it, it's, it's, it's a deep cut, it's but really it's uh, cut. apparently not a place you want to go. So yeah, it's just a, it's a really deep cut. Like, only the deepest of... I, I caught it as a reference, but I didn't know what it was referencing to. I just I, I figured it was just like a bad place <laughs> bad place you didn't want to go and uh, it was it was not cool to mention. <laughs> but I thought it was pretty funny. And then I was uh, pretty soon after I was distracted by Tendi's taco salad the first time we watched it because <laughs> it, it was it looked really good. They it animated was, a really excellent taco it, salad. It, it, I was it, like, it, I it, want it, that salad. It, it um yeah, I, I really liked the latest episode overall. Like I really liked it. Other than the fact that once again it pushes it, it more it more overtly than any other episode prior really pushes the 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 Tendi Rutherford uh romantic relationship. Yeah. But like other than that, I thought this was the best episode of Lord X thus far. Um, um, I really liked it. Yeah, the badgy thing really like that may have been the B plot. But I feel like it was the stronger oh, plot by far. Absolutely, it was so much better. And and I I think they must have let Jack McBrayer like I feel like 
I was asking Gary if Jack McBrayer would had been allowed to ad lib a lot of the things that he was yelling at them, the horrible yeah. things he was going to say, Badgie was going to do. I'm going to wear your skin. <laughs> I'm going to boil your hearts. It was just like amazing. It was like the, Kenneth on on evil Kenneth, evil evil psychotic Kenneth. It was really wonderful. Even even the latter, like the the a plot wasn't really doing it for me until it was, and then when it was, it was really doing it for me. Uh, like it makes no sense that the core gains sentience, but oh my god, it was so funny. <laughs> it gained I sentience and it gained the personality of of that dude, and it was just like horrible horrible you were like why i think the favorite part my favorite part of that to be honest was like shack finally was allowed he's just desperate the whole time to fire and the captain won't let him shoot and he's like i've been so good just let me fire on their warp core she's like no we have to do everything possible and he's finally allowed to target their warp core and the weapons won't work but the core kills it and he's like I'm going to take it as a win. We won. We did it. Yay, us. <laughs> Dax just kills me constantly. He's like... Uh, I also really love that after, after like, the warp core... Um, oh, not the warp core. After, after the, the data core, like, gains sentient, disables, and consumes the enemy ship. They're just like, uh, uh... Let's just promote the guy responsible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Well, he clearly meant to do it. And let's transfer him somewhere else. <laughs> He's somebody imagine. else's problem. He got fired in a week. <laughs> well, that's smart, right? Like that's a that's a good mariner move where you like you make someone someone else's problem. Yep. Yep. Then yeah. Let them sort it out. Oh, well, she probably learned that from her mom and dad. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> she's, she's been made somebody else's problem enough times to know how to do that pretty quick. Yep. We'll just, we'll just move them somewhere else. Then yeah, she was I like, thought... he's Earth's problem now. He's not ours. Ha-ha, <laughs> right? So. Yeah. I, um, like, I really like this episode. I thought it was really good. I thought it was really funny. Uh, B plot and A plot both. Like I said, A plot starts off a little wonky, but once it gets going, it gets really good. Well, you have to believe that he's going to do his job like everybody else at first. Yeah, yeah. I also like that we got to see Delta Shift finally, yeah. because they've been they've been talking shit about Delta Shift so often, and then we finally got to see them, and they're like, they're like, no, we didn't sabotage you. We were there too. Doing the choo choo dance, like whatever okay. the hell that that was ridiculous. What what is the choo choo dance? And why I don't it... even know. I'm like, you know, that's that's cool. You guys are all obsessed with this thing, whatever the hell it is. That's that was really funny, and the, it was nice that Mariner and Boiler bonded over their their fandom of the choo choo dance, and then he made shirts for them, and she wore the shirt. Yep. That's the, the best part. Uniform, no less. Yeah, she wasn't too cool to wear the shirt. I'm like, oh, that's nice. You guys are friends, like real friends, bonding. Not, not only was she not too cool, she was like straight up excited to wear it. I know. She's like, oh, you made a shirt? Oh my god. Yeah, it was it was good all around. Um, I I I thought it was pretty funny though that like I just love Shaq being willing to take any victory. He didn't destroy it, but he's just happy it's destroyed. He's he's happy somebody blew it up. Like and I, I also like this episode really, really took took advantage of the animated format. Um like uh Gliffy would not work in any other TNG show or any other Star Trek show just because um like you couldn't sell that character. Yep in a live action it would look too ridiculous it would look too cartoony it would it would even though it would make perfect because of course like the of course the holodeck can make cartoony characters mm -hmm. but it wouldn't make visual sense in the language of cinema or language of the tv show and it would like break that that fourth wall but in lower decks they can absolutely do that 100 percent, and and they could uh they could keep switching the holodeck uh makeups right so mm -hmm. 
they could e easily use it for, you know, like a uh, training exercise and then switch it to, you know, a Bajoran marketplace, a freezing cold mountaintop, the wall of China, the Great Wall of China, like whatever, without having to actually shoot in any of those places or yeah. do green screens that look silly or, or, you know, whatever, because they just, they need people to draw it. That's about it. And so, I mean, not to undermine how long that takes to draw, I'm sure it's like it's, it's, a lot it's, of work, but still they can, so they can like, take advantage of that format. Yeah, as you exactly. said. It's, I mean, I think, don't quote me on this. I might be wrong, but I remember reading somewhere that at, 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 at the time of creation, Discovery was the most expensive TV show ever made. Wow. Um, I can believe that. I can just, believe it's up there. Like, yeah. Um, so, and, and, and it would have trouble doing something like that. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like a lot of the stuff Discovery does, I'm impressed by what it can do in the places it can kind of um, recreate or create. Yeah. But um, yeah, there there would be a lot of difficulties, and and at the same time, you don't have to have actors trying to imagine a lot of this stuff. Yeah, um, they're doing voice acting, so they're already doing that to a certain extent. They don't have to be in a scene where they're acting at something that's not there. So yeah. Yeah. that's something too. Uh, I was surprised to learn that that I was, I had assumed all of the voice acting was done before quarantine, and that only the animation was still to remain. So I was surprised to hear on the um, on the panel that they were like, "No, we're 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 doing voice acting in our closets right now." Yeah, yeah. I guess they're still doing it like right up to as production is going on, as they're animating stuff, like yeah. right up to when they're ready to broadcast practically, which makes a certain I mean, amount of sense. It, it's Titmouse, and I know Titmouse works that way with Rick and Morty, so I shouldn't be surprised. Um, and, but a lot of places will do the do the voice acting a fair bit in advance, so they have time to animate the the voice the the, the mouth movement to the to the voice acting. But well, I mean, I I can see where it might help to kind of have it as uh, close to the animation as possible. Mm -hmm. So. Also, with a new show, I'm sure there's a lot of tweaking with the scripts and the animation, um, fairly close to broadcast. So they might be kind of figuring out things as they go along and wanting to adjust them as they yeah. go along. And there's only a certain amount that you can do in editing. They might have to do uh, voice pickups and some extra animation ahead of yeah. time. Like yep. if a show runs short or if they decide something's not working, they, they may have to do some extra work. So so if I remember correctly, there's only 10 episodes in the season. So we're, we've only got four episodes we've left. We've got four episodes season. left, yep. But then as soon as Lower Dex is over, Discovery starts. Yeah, when we'll be right into drop. Discovery. And they just dropped a pretty intense trailer for uh, Discovery on, on Star Trek for, Day. I, I didn't watch the panel, but I did watch the trailer. I watched the panel, and Gary watched the panel. Uh, they didn't give a ton away. Um, I won't talk a lot about it because uh, not to to spoil anything. But uh, they talked a little bit about uh, the new character, about uh, Booker, uh, Cleveland Booker, who is the man that uh, you see uh, Michael Burnham with a lot in the trailer, and his cat. Um, his fabulous, amazing is, cat named is, Grudge. Is that the same dude from that short track that premiered right before season two about uh, the dude who finds himself on Discovery, an abandoned Discovery in the far, far future? Is that the same guy? I believe it is, yeah. Okay, he did yeah. a short track. I, yeah, I, he I, was talking about it. I watched, because I watched them like, all right. I, I figured right away, especially when season two ended, that I'm like, okay, this is a teaser for season three. Yeah, he's he's I I recognize him from other things. Uh, he's a British actor, um, so his American accent is is not real in that. That's not his actual accent. Um, I I don't remember what I know him from at the moment, but I did, 
I, I watched, did recognize him. Um, I watched so little TV that. Yeah. And, and they uh, mentioned that they, they did talk about the new two new characters, the non-binary and uh, the trans character, the, the guy who's the trans guy a little mm -hmm. bit, but they said that their, um, their situation in the show is very specific. And so they can't talk a lot about it without spoiling uh, it. I imagine it'll be, uh, imagine that it'll be a lot like Tignataro. Like Tignataro in season two, she really had one episode dedicated to her. And then she was just kind of in the background all over the place. Mm. Um, like she didn't, Tignataro didn't get a lot to do in uh, season two of Discovery. And I'm not complaining. I actually really love her on that show. Uh, she feels like she walked in from an entirely different show. And I kind of love the yeah. dynamic she has. Um, so I'm not complaining about lack of Tignataro, but I, I have a feeling that these new, these two new characters, um, uh, probably won't be that major players. They'll probably have like an episode that focuses on the heavily and they'll probably be somewhere in the background, which discovery seems to do a lot. Uh, I forget the character's name, but there was that, that, that sort of cyborg character in discovery season one, two, who was on the back of a bridge on on the bridge crew, but mm -hmm. like we never really found out where a deal was until like the episode she died. Uh, spoilers, I guess it's been a year since that aired, but um, so I apologize if I spoiled that for anyone if anyone's not caught up on Discovery. But uh, then we get an entire dedicate episode dedicated to her. Here's her whole thing in one episode, uh, and I, I mean I got issues with how they did that. I thought it was really manipulative. Um, it was a sad episode, but yeah, I mean, it was it was sad I, to find out all that stuff, I, I and then she was they, gone, and I was they, like, they, man, that that's brutal. Like it felt it felt like it's like oh we're gonna we're gonna kill this character and we want you to feel bad about it, so we're gonna finally develop her in the episode yeah. before her, instead of like developing her organically through. Which is kind of unfair. Yeah. Um, so, but Discovery does that. It does that a lot. Like, same with Tilly. Like, Tilly was a big... See, Discovery Season 2, she was a big part of the first half and then got forgotten in the second half. Um, and so I, I got a feeling... Uh, well, they go back and forth, yeah, because that happened with um, Stamets and Culber a little bit, too, yeah. for a bit. They, yeah. they, they had a lot of focus for a while and they got backgrounded for a bit and then they had a lot of focus. But uh, apparently the, I guess, one of the characters, or both, I think one of the characters, maybe the Trill, is going to have um, some interaction or, or a relationship with Stamets and Culver. Oh, so that was one part that they were going to talk about. I'm, I'm definitely, I'm just, like I said, I'm, I'm excited to see these characters. I'm excited to see what they do on the show. Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to shit talk discovery. I do. I do enjoy discovery. I just, I don't I, on, on topic of representation. Mm. Um, I don't expect these characters to be like in every episode, like being representative of trans characters as a regular reoccurring character. Um, I expect them to get maybe an episode a piece and then have little moments throughout the rest of the show here and there. And I mean, As to, some ex to some extent, I think, to some extent, that's that's good. Yeah. To some extent, because it's like, then it's not treating them so much differently than other supporting characters. Yeah. Despite um, that, like, it's not like we're going to use these people to show them that how different they are all the time. Yeah. We're going to introduce them as part of the crew and then they're part of the crew, right? Yeah. To some yeah. extent, that's good. To some extent, it may highlight a, a larger problem with Discovery, which is like they bring on people and then don't know what to do with them after a while. Yeah, it's, it's, um, and I think it's part, I think it's part of the growing pains adapting to the new format. Like in an episodic format, you could just bring a character in, have an episode about them, and then never bring them up again. Uh, but because they have the serialized format, that changes how you can approach those one-shot characters. And so, I don't know. Like I said, season two handled the handled the serialized format better than season one. So hopefully, season three will will improve again. I mean, it it, it has a huge um, shift in tone and setting 
And I think that's, um, that's only going to benefit it because it can break away with a lot of things. So the, Discovery as a prequel was always a bad idea right from the start. So the one, the one thing that from the panel that I found really interesting and I think will change the show in a big way. Um, I think Jonathan Freaks said it. Actually, it was because he does a, a lot of the directing on uh, Discovery right now. He, he directed and that me. means he's in Toronto a lot. So if you're in Toronto, keep an eye out for old man Freaks because he's yeah. uh, wandering around a lot. He, he, um, uh, he directed the best episode of season one. And uh, he mentioned that uh, he talked to Stanequa Martin Green, um, obviously, about the character. And he said that there was just a lot more um, joy in the character um, yeah. that Michael just felt a lot more joyous and there was a lot more feeling in the character. He said them before. And she said to him, the difference is my character is no longer defined by fear. Yeah. Well, and she resolved things with her brother. And so that, that like resolved a lot of the anxiety with her character uh, yeah, she she just said that she was no longer defined by fear. So, it he said it just changed the whole show and the whole set and the feeling yeah. of the show. Yep. And I'm like, oh man, that's really interesting, uh, because you don't really see Michael as someone who's afraid, right? Yeah. So, uh, and I'm, I'm interested in Strange New Worlds, and I should go back and watch that panel. I just haven't had the opportunity to do so. Um. But they they seem like a fun group. Um, oh, I, I I genuinely loved Pike in season season one. I thought he had a great or season two of Discovery. So I'm happy to see him get a spinoff. Um, Anson Mount and Rebecca Romaine Stamos, who's number one, who uh, well Rebecca Romaine now. Sorry, uh, Rebecca Romaine, who is married to Jerry O'Connell, who plays Ransom. Uh, so apparently they fight over who's the better number one all the time in their house, which is great. Um, I enjoyed that. I think they should fight where we can see it because they're both attractive people and that would be <laughs> entertaining. Um, so it's Anson Mount, Rebecca Romaine, and I forget the dude who plays Spock, but he looks very different when he's not Spock. He's got a little goatee yeah. and mustache and fluffy hair and glasses. It's super cute. And I'm like, you're not Spock. Come on. He looks like a Montreal developer. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean, like, like a, like a web developer or something? Yeah. I, like, like he works for CBC. Yeah. <laughs> like I know that guy. He like, works for CBC Montreal. Look at him. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, they, if you want to, if you want to do a prequel to uh, TOS, mm -hmm. this makes far more sense than what they try to do with Discovery. Yes. Well, apparently they worked together really well. Like they were saying that they were kind of like when they shot the pilot, they were kind of like, I hope we get to do this. Cause, cause this feels good guys. Like we all like each other. So, I mean, I kind of hope they get to. Yeah. And like, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's one of those things where we know how it ends. And I think in this case, that kind of improves it. Because yeah. we know that this crew does not get a happy ending. Yeah. And I mean, it has to come to an end at some point as well. Well, you know, one of the interesting things that the uh, actor who plays Pike said was like knowing his fate, right? Because he had yeah. that image, he had that vision from the crystal. So he knows like he's going to end up in a wheelchair basically largely burned. So like that that's gonna inform a lot of his decision making, right? And he was asked like what have you done with that? Like now that you're you're gonna be playing like how do you digest that? And he's like, I'm still trying to kind of figure out what it means to know what your fate is. Like to know live to know it is going to happen this way. Yeah. Uh, that would so be tough to play. I didn't watch the panel, but I do remember watching a video. I don't know where or what content. I do remember him talking about that. That would be really tough to play. That would be really tough to play, well, um, having that in your head all the time. Especially, 
especially as Pike is a moralist. So Pike, Pike like bases decisions not off of what is best for personal, but for what is like what is the most moral. Yeah. So for him, he is as a character, he's not going to try to avoid that. No. 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 Like I mean, so so in your head as an actor, you have to have like my character knows where this is going to end up. How will he let that affect his decision or will he not let that affect his decision? Yeah. You know, how do I play these thought processes? Or do I have my character just say, I'm not going to let that affect my decisions, even though that's in my head all the time. Yeah. Well, I think like, I think, what they'll do is Pike will try. So I'd be speculating just from how Pike has already been portrayed. They will probably have him try not to have it affect his decision, but it inevitably will. Excuse me. Yeah, which is interesting because then it puts um, number one and Spock in a position of of trying to mitigate that. I suppose yeah. depending how much they know. Well, and or yeah, how much they're aware of. That's assuming they know. Um, Dep the, depending how much they know, yeah. So, and then we also, like, another thing is we don't know how many seasons this is going to get. I doubt the writers even know how many seasons it's going to get. So, does this resolve itself at the end of season one? Or does it resolve itself seven seasons from now? Well, it's a really nice way for, for the writers to be able to wrap things up, I suppose, yeah. right? Like, you always know that you have that out. You can always write that end of the season if, if you know for sure that things are going to end well. That that there's your trap door, yeah. To to finish things up, yeah. So so maybe we'll we'll see. I suppose we'll see if we're going to stream. We'll definitely have something about this disco for sure because we've watched um, seasons both all seasons of that so far. Um, opinions are mixed. I really like the first season. That's me, but um, I, I just love Jason Isaacs in that. I. My issues with season one are mostly to do with pacing. I actually like a lot of the plot on display. Mm -hmm. uh, and every actor gives it their fucking all. Like the performances in Discovery season one and two are just top notch. Amazing. Um, I, I just, I think, I think they, there was some struggle with figuring out how to tell these stories in a serialized format as opposed, or rather, uh, um, uh, and uh, yes, yeah, a serialized format as opposed to an episodic format. So I think that there was some issue there. So things got paced weird. Um, but I think a lot, a lot of the Star Trek shows, though, I think the newer Star Trek shows seem to have because we've talked about pacing issues with Picard yeah. as well. Yeah. And uh, when we did our Picard uh, season wrap up, we definitely talked about how they had pacing issues and uh, some some just weird order of events issues. Yeah. I don't know what you would describe that as probably yeah. just narrative, narrative structure issues. I definitely think that discovery season one for those problems is worse than Picard. Uh, although discovery season two, I think is better than Picard. So, well, I mean, they, they had a season two, so I mean that that helps a lot, but I, yeah. I do miss with discovery. I miss Jason Isaacs in, in, in a big, big way. I have to say, oh, I, 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 Something tells me we will see uh, we will see Lorca again. Well, there's another Lorca, right? That's yeah. the thing. There's still a prime Lorca, right? Because uh, I, I don't think we'll see him on Discovery, but I'd be very surprised if he doesn't show up on the Section Thirty One show that they are apparently still making. Because it was evil Lorca, right? Yeah, yeah. So where is Prime Lorca? That that's my thing. Yeah. So I strongly suspect that whenever the Section Thirty One show. Uh, it's it's wild to me that we're getting uh, Strange New Worlds before we're getting Section Thirty One, because Section Thirty One has been in work for a long time. Like that. Yeah, was... I think there might be problems with it. I don't know what. It's kind of sad because that's the Michelle Yeoh show, but you know. I I forget. Did Michelle Yeoh travel into the future with them? I think I think she was in the trailer. So. Yeah. Yeah, she was yeah. thrown in the trailer. So I mean, he was in the trailer. So I mean, that might be part of what's affecting the Section Thirty One yeah, show. Maybe, is they maybe, they want to keep her in the future for a bit. Maybe the Section Thirty One show isn't happening anymore. Maybe maybe that's why they moved her in the future to keep her on, keep her around there. 
Um, well, I, don't... I wouldn't want to give her up from Discovery personally. Like, I was just like, why is she getting her own show? Like, I mean, yeah. of course, why is she getting her own show? She's Michelle Yeoh. But at the same time, it, like, that's a big person to give up. She just brings so oh, much wow. to Discovery. Like, so yeah. much. So. Um, and I, mean, to... I love Sorry. watching her ham it up. It's oh, so... my God. She's so good at <laughs> It's like she's just like I'm evil. Look how evil I am. Oh, I'm gonna be evil, evil time. She's so enjoying herself. Oh my her. god, she is. She's just like I love being evil. Evil's the best. I'm the evilest. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, um, back to lower ducks, so we can wrap it up. Uh, we may we may do a strange in the world stream. We yeah, we seem to like everyone on it, so maybe we will. I mean, I'm watching it either way, because what am I going to do, not watch Star Trek? Yeah, exactly. Are we going to not watch a new Star Trek? Pro probably not. And we will probably have opinions, because we have opinions on everything. And and I I want Rebecca Romaine to make out with somebody, honestly. <laughs> She's very pretty. You're very pretty, Rebecca Romaine, as is your husband. You're cool people. Uh, anyway, yeah, Lower Decks have got four episodes left. What do you think we're going to see? In, in is, is there going to be like a season finale cliffhanger, do you think? Is the Cerritos going to be left in deep trouble somewhere? or So we're guaranteed to get a season Moderate season. trouble. It's, it's already, <laughs> Lower Decks has already been renewed for a second season. So mm -hmm. a cliffhanger isn't unreasonable. They are, I want to say no, but also they are doing the Brooklyn Nine-Nine thing. And Brooklyn Nine Nine does always end on a cliffhanger. It's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I could see them ending on a cliffhanger. Well, maybe I, maybe it will be. I would imagine it would be something to do with Mariner and uh, getting transferred potentially. Transferred or possibly court-martialed. Court-martialed would be a good one uh, if he got Boimler court-martialed somehow. Yeah. Maybe they will all get court-martialed. I think we'll see a resolution to the Rutherford Tendy crush plot. So I think it like I don't know how it's going to end. I don't know like it's possible that Rutherford could make a move on her and she rejects him, or what I'm hoping for. It could <laughs> pardon. This this is what, what I'm personally hoping for. for. Yeah, He's, um, Barry's I, just hoping for it to just be done me, over. I kind of hope that they get together, realize they don't work, and then go back to being friends. That that's. That's sure. the resolution I would like. That'd be a nice resolution. Sure, I'll take that. Um, but like, I, I think we could see that, or we could see them uh, just get together and then just them be an item for season two, which I, I, I kind of expect that. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I expect. It's not what I hope, but it's kind of what I expect with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, but plot wise, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot. I don't know. Like. The, I I I I would not have predicted any of the plots that that Lord X has thrown at us so far. Oh, maybe uh, it's a badgie. The a badgie um, cliffhanger. Maybe, maybe. I suspect if we see a cliffhanger, it'll be a court martial or a transfer. It could be. There could be that, but there could also it, be a badgie situation, or or you know, well, Mariner's well, getting court-martialed or transferred, and only she can help with a badgie takeover situation or something like possible, that. Um, you know, Boimler gets promoted and then realizes well, he doesn't like command. <laughs> that would be really funny. That would be very funny, but I, I, I somehow can't see that happening. I think you would love being in command. That, I, would be, I think, I, yeah, I think, like, I, I definitely think we'll see that, but I think later yeah no i i am yeah. and i'm wondering if there's going to be some sort of um i feel like there might be a ransom mariner hookup yeah. before the end of the season yep yeah. yeah, they foreshow that hard um uh, i think it's gonna be i don't think it's gonna be a, a happy like yay hookup like they're gonna be together i think it's definitely gonna be awkward and weird it's gonna it's gonna be them trying to hide it from the captain Yes. Well, I think he's going to find out pretty soon after that that she's the captain's daughter, and that's going to freak him out. Um, yep. I'm pretty sure of that. Something. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's going to 
be like, I need to hide it from the captain because she's going to murder me. I'm also, I'm, I'm just trying to think of like what what are the big cliche uh, Star Trek tropes that we haven't seen yet. Hmm. Like we haven't seen any like ghost lover yeah. people yet. <laughs> like Q or, himself is a Star Trek trope, and we know we're only getting like a little bit of Q, just just as a, as a treat. Yeah, uh, no, no mind control type thing yet. So oh, kind, of, kind of with the parasite, but but nothing that like, has taken over the whole ship and made them think. You know, no game that's taken over the whole ship and controlled their mind, or or a creature that has made everyone think they have to fight each other, or you know. So so they definitely need a mind control episode. I think. Yeah. Um, they got like, turned into zombies. More, is, you know, would, a little bit. I would like to see more away missions. I don't know that we'll see that, but I would like to see more away missions. I could see at least one more away mission. They've only had one, really. Two, sorry. Was there two or one? There, two. there was two. two. I mean, three, two. three if two. you count, count the Klingon diplomat. Oh, right. So, so three, technically. Okay, fair enough. No, I, I can see another uh, badgy holodeck malfunction kind of wrapping up the season, maybe. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, I can also see badgy being a once a, once a season thing. That would be fair as well. I mean, you again, like like Moriarty, you don't want too much of, yeah. of badgy. Or evil Morty and Rick and Morty. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I haven't seen it, but obviously, it's it's something that you just want to you want to have only a little bit of. You don't want to overdo it with that. So I guess we'll see. We'll see what the future holds. Um, mm -hmm, for sure, I I would be really happy if if uh, Mariners uh, hanging out with Barbara Brinson turned into a hookup just to freak Mar uh, freak out Boimler. That I, would I, that would mean see that would have been my ultimate um, part of the episode is that you know they start making out and Boimler wakes up and sees them and freaks out and that's why they break up and there's no parasite at all. That that Sweet. would have been good. That would have been good. I, I would have laughed at that. Yeah. That's me. I, and he kind of got those vibes for a moment and then they, they just didn't do it. Yeah. I'm always like, do it. Go there. Come on. Yeah. For me. All right. I unfortunately have to bounce. I think. No, please do. Please All do. Right. We should wrap it up. It's uh, yeah. It's been over an hour anyway. So uh, thank you, RC. Thank you, All Gary, right. for you, everything. Well, and have a good day. Yeah. We will be back in two weeks. I'll yep. just do this. With All right, you can go. Of Lower Decks. Yeah, for, for the next couple of episodes of Lower Decks. I'm just going right. to show this. I will see you then. Yep. Have a good night. Have a good night. In the meantime, please follow us on Twitter. I've just got that going across the screen. You can follow RC at, uh, at a Young Green City. You can follow me at Noise Angel, and you can follow Gary at Spearwalker, though Gary says that he does not tweet a lot right now. And I yeah down there also coming up soon rc and i will be doing a alien rpg podcast with the roll together podcast that's a podcast that uh rc will be doing uh the gming for and i'm playing as well as a number of other people so it's going to be pretty cool we've already played a few sessions and i think it's going to be fun so yeah and uh, we'll be back in two weeks to talk about episodes seven and eight of Lower Decks. In the meantime, you can tweet us and let us know what you think of the stream. And we'll have this up on YouTube later. Thanks so much. And talk to you guys in a couple of weeks. Bye. Bye.